Good day and welcome to the webinar, Protecting Critical Communication Systems from Interference. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sandra Wendelkin and I'm the editor of Mission Critical Communications Magazine. I'll be moderating the webinar today and Enritsu is the webinar sponsor. We have some excellent information and an expert presenter scheduled for today's webinar. We will include time at the end of the webinar for questions for attendees and we will do our best to wrap up the webinar in an hour to be courteous of everyone's time. In light of everything going on in the world, I just want to especially thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. We hope you're all healthy and navigating our new situation as best as possible. Please look uh, to mccmag.com for the latest coronavirus updates as they relate to mission critical communications. If we can help you or your organization in any way, please contact us. Before we begin our presentation, I want to briefly explain a few of the user features of our webinar service. To the left is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you'll see the presentation. You'll see the attendee control panel on the upper right hand side of your screen. The control panel can be expanded or collapsed by clicking the icons on the left side of each pane. Also use the control panel to ask questions and select your audio mode. The default audio mode is mic and speakers through your computer, but you can also click the telephone button and dial in using the number you received in your email. All attendees are muted to reduce background noise. If you'd like to submit a question for the presenter or myself, use the questions pane. Just type in your question and click send to submit. We will reserve time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And Ritsu has made a PDF of the slide presentation available. You will see a handouts pane in your control panel. Click the name of the handout to access it. Your default web browser will automatically launch and open a blank page and the handout file will automatically start downloading to your designated downloads location. You can then click the downloaded file to open it or save it. Finally, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to all registrants about 24 hours after this and will be available at mccmag.com. Now for more on our presenter. Russell Lindsay is a product manager at Enritsu focusing on handheld test and measurement equipment. Russ has worked in the test and measurement industry for the past eight years, prior to which he spent time in various engineering roles in aerospace and defense, from system engineering and tests to research and de development design. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Utah and an MBA from Arizona State University. With that, we'll get started. Thank you again for joining us, and Russ will now begin our presentation. All right, thank you, Sandra. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope you're all um, hunkered down in your home offices and uh, staying healthy. Um, today's topic on protecting critical communication systems from interference, we're gonna discuss uh, some of the sources of interference. Um, we're going to talk about the problem. Uh, why is it important to protect our critical interference systems? excuse me, our critical communication systems from interference, um, what different types of sources do we have, and then talk about some mitigation steps uh, in, ge in general. And then we're also gonna go into some specifics on a tool, uh, the MS-2090A Fieldmaster Pro from Anritsu and how that can be used for mitigating interference in the field as well. Uh, so to begin with the problem of interference, interference. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially what we have is a situation where um, resource, frequency resources are limited. Uh, there's a finite uh, of a finite amount of spectrum available um, and usage of that spectrum is strictly controlled. So any portion of this wide swath of spectrum we have starting from kilohertz level up to 300 gigahertz um, is specifically controlled by uh, governmental regulations, and the use of those frequency spectrums um, is is ex extremely important because you don't want to have all these communications going on top of each other. So rights are expensive to obtain. So any company who spent a lot of money in obtaining the rights to transmit in a certain frequency is going to want to protect those. Um, so. And as things change over time, there's going to be a need to try to make sure that people are shifting their use cases around in appropriate ways. Um, a very specific example that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is this frequency range from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. <clears throat> Even just this small portion of frequency is, uh, is packed with all sorts of different communications, and those communication systems are changing as the world evolves. As we go into 5G, we'll talk a little bit specifically about how that's changed this swath of frequency. Um, and so it's very important that as um, operators of these communication networks work through their different frequency bands that they make sure that those bands are clean and free of interference. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about some of the sources of interference. What uh, 
what types of things uh, really interrupt the communication systems? Uh, really, I'd, I'd like to break this down into two different groups, random sources and intentional or nefarious sources. So what are some examples of random sources? Now these can be things like low quality electronics. <clears throat> so I have on this uh, on this slide a picture of a an arc welder in the top right corner there. Um, this is you know you wouldn't think that an arc welder would be a problem, but these are uh, these are this is equipment with oscillating uh, alternators and equipment inside that it, at the time it was built had no thought given to what sort of um, RF radiation is coming from this uh, this type of a uh, product. So. These types of things can be major interferers into communication networks. Um, there's sources of intermodulation, like rusty bolts and loose cables, can really interfere or disrupt communications. Uh, industrial machinery. Um, one big, big problem that's been happening over the years is uh, there are miles and miles of cable TV coaxial cable um, installed in the ground. And over the years, as the insulation on those cables wear away, uh, the the and the copper is exposed. That copper can actually radiate signals out into the atmosphere that interfere with communication systems. Um, and even something as simple as a, a neon uh, light fixture, a fluorescent light fixture, uh, can interfere with some of the signals. So <clears throat> those are things that um, maybe people didn't, as things were installed years ago, with no need to think through how they would impact communication systems today, can be can be a problem. And then there are intentional or nefarious sources. So, um, in in some cases, in military, uh, in in sort of military operations, you have jammers. Uh, even in just communication systems, you have covert hidden signals. So, um, people trying to transmit uh, signals in places where they shouldn't. And then even um, bugs, which isn't an interference on the communication system, but it is a a disruption in the normal operation of a communication system. So these are all uh, important pieces of the communication architecture that need to be uh, sussed out and figured out and worked through uh, as you're trying to protect your critical communication systems. <clears throat> so uh, a couple of examples. Uh, this is, we had an example where um, we had a wireless carrier in the US who they were seeing a, a major dip in their um, key performance indicators, their KPIs. Uh, so there was a, a, net, a neighborhood was reporting to show um, bad dropped, you know, dropped calls or bad throughput, those kinds of things. Um, there was no obvious change into the environment that they knew of, um, and so they were the team was sent out to uh, to try to solve that. And I'm going to keep you in suspense on this particular one. We're going to show you a little bit later how this was solved. Um, another one that uh, an example that I use of a nefarious source, and maybe nefarious is a strong word, but again, a network operator uh, getting complaints of performance issues in a certain neighborhood. Um, they were asked to go out and to do some investigation on what was going on. Um, <clears throat> the issue was only happening during the day, it seemed to clear up at night. So they went out and did some investigation and they found that uh, a store owner in a in a shopping center had bought an online uh, had bought a an LTE jammer online and was operating it illegally and essentially uh, this store owner just wanted to keep employees from being on their cell phone during work hours so it was uh, he, he was tired of having to tell his employees to put down their phone so went and bought a jammer and turned it on during work uh, work hours and uh, Basically, that was his way of keeping them off of their their network. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit in the, in uh, in future slides here about how that type of interference is is hunted down and and eliminated. So, now we're really going to go into all the different steps of interference mitigation. Um, I've broken down these steps into three general categories. Uh, the first being spectrum monitoring and clearing. Uh, the second, signal identification. And then finally, we're going to go into interference location finding. So once once we know there's interference, once we've learned some things about the interference, uh, we can start to pinpoint where that interference is, which is the last step in removing it. <clears throat> so in the first stage, spectrum clearing and monitoring. So why do we do clearing and monitoring? It's really the first round of information. Um, the It gives you information on the timing of an interference, uh, general location, of where the interference is coming from, uh, some idea of the frequency and the amplitude. 
uh, this about this bit of information can really help you narrow in to start to identify and track the source. Um, <clears throat> when is it done? Clearing is typically done before deployment. So if uh, if somebody has recently acquired a, a rights to transmit in a new frequency, uh, it may be important for them at that point to do some before turning on their transmitters to do some monitoring of that of that frequency range to ensure that there are no communications, that things have been cleared out, then any sort of legacy uh, devices that were existing in that frequency range have been removed. Um, once the clearing has been done and the uh, the transmissions have begun, uh, monitoring begins. So this could be done at random over days, weeks, hours, um, essentially making sure that, uh, that, that, again, protecting that asset that's been acquired there for the for that communication system so how is it done um, it can be done I mentioned earlier that in some cases KPIs are monitored so looking through just anecdotally um, how is my communication system functioning is it uh, is it working static free are there is it free of any sort of uh, dropped communications uh, are there any sort of strange anomalies that are happening there and then <clears throat> Uh, in more detail, you can then go into RF tools that can, uh, like spectrum analyzers, that can look through the spectrum, monitor what's happening, and identify any sort of transmissions in that uh, in that area. So, uh, to discuss a real-world need as an example for spectrum clearing, um, recently uh, the the FCC opened up a new section of 600 megahertz uh, spectrum for the use in 5G. So I uh, have here an article that says the FCC announced results of a 600 megahertz auction. Uh, there were, uh, T-Mobile really came out as the big winner. They spent uh, almost $8 billion at auction to acquire the rights to transmit in these 600 megahertz bands. Um, and so what that kicked off was this activity of spectrum repacking. So essentially um, in that 600 megahertz frequency range you had typically or traditionally had local broadcast television networks that were using that frequency to transmit their signals over the air. Now um, now they're being asked to essentially uh, remove all their communications, move them to a different band of frequency or remove them altogether. And so if, if you're T-Mobile and you've just spent all of this money on, uh, on this network, on this bandwidth, uh, you're going to want to go and make sure that in each local area um, as you go through and you monitor your your um, your bandwidth before you deploy your 600 megahertz 5G network, you're going to do some spectrum clearing to make sure that uh, all those all those uh, broadcast television channels are gone. <clears throat> um, another example here, uh, something that's been talked about again, um, not to pick too hard on 5G, uh, but. Uh, as 5G is opening up bands in the millimeter wave frequencies, so at 24 gigahertz, there's been a lot of concern on how it's going to impact weather satellites. So you'll see a lot of articles, uh, like the one I show here on the right, and there's links to this article uh, if you want to read it later. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of concern that if uh, if the the 5G signals transmitting in the 24 gigahertz bands uh, bleed out into or raise up the noise um, in the 23 gigahertz high 23 gigahertz bands where uh, basically, they're monitoring frequencies in water droplets to make uh, predictions on weather uh, that it's going to greatly hinder our ability to do weather predicting. So uh, both both sides, again, have an interest. You have um, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, who have all spent a lot of money to try to acquire bandwidth in this 24 gigahertz range. They're going to want to ensure that it's clear. And then you also have these operators, so those well, their satellites, that uh, they're going to want to ensure that as um, 24 gigahertz 5G radios are deployed, that there's no um, that there's no interruption in their in their weather predictions. Um, okay, so the next step after you've done your monitoring, you've done your clearing, or you continue to do that, maybe you've uh, identified that there is some sort of source of interference. Uh, that's where you might step into signal identification. Now this step isn't always necessary. Um, in some cases, uh, just knowing that there's a signal or just seeing a signal in spectrum, you can tell what, what it is. But for those instances for um, communication systems that need a deeper analysis, especially in cases where you have nefarious interference, 
it can be very telling and very helpful to understand on a deeper level um, what the different uh, characteristics of the signal are. So signal identification essentially can tell you things like, is the signal repetitive um, on the short or long term? Does it have patterns of common modulation schemes, um, which can help identify whether or not it's a it's an intentional or, or a nefarious signal? Um, is it random in amplitude, phase, and frequency? So all these things are, are deeper insights to help. When you understand this better, now you can feel, now you, these are clues to help you understand where the source of this interference might be. Um, so when is signal identif identification done? Um, signal identification typically takes a lot of data. Um, it's, uh, it, it can be very time consuming to dig through the data, to process the data. So usually signal identification is done when, uh, as a second step after initial understanding of an interference happens. So you, you want to, as much as possible, understand the, the timing of the interference and the frequency of the interference so you can zero in your analysis just on that interference source. That's not always possible, so tools there are tools that can help you do longer term um, signal identification. It just helps in it helps simplify the the uh, the process of, of post processing that data. Um, so how's it done? Um, typically done through signal playback, sample digit digitization, vector signal analysis. All of these tools can be used to help understand the signal. So. Um, where is this, uh, you know, what's an example of where this is really important? Think about in a, you know, in the, on a, a communication stage for military defense. Um, communications are critical. Sophisticated jammers um, can carry real risk. Uh, if I have a, let's say, you know, I have a radar uh, aircraft that's out monitoring the, the land operations or it's out monitoring any sort of, uh, any sort of looking for any, any, nefarious aircraft. Um, if that signal is jammed, it leaves the, the area vulnerable. Um, so signal identification is a strong risk mitigation in these examples. Um, so I'm going to do, this is a very hypothetical um, situation. These, for real world examples, these can often be a little more sensitive. So I, I kind of made one up, but I want to show you kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about signal, uh, really getting into signal identification. So Let's take a possible situation where let's go back to that 5G millimeter wave service. Let's say you're just deploying something at 24 gigahertz. Um, you did spectrum clearing three months ago. Uh, everything passed. It seemed like everything was clear. And then suddenly, you know, just recently it started where every Saturday morning your KPIs start dropping. You're dropping calls. Your data throughput is bad. You're getting complaints from your customers. Um, things aren't working as you expect. So you need to go out and do some investigation. Um, so let's say you go out and you do some spectrum monitoring and you identify that in this 24 gigahertz band you have uh, a radar signal. So this is, um, you see this is a, a little pulse signal that is repeating every second and sweeping through a slight frequency range. But um, again, to take our hypothetical a little further, let's say your frequency of transmission is just off to the left of that one, a slightly lower in frequency. Uh, and you think, well, okay, I see this weird, strange pulse signal, but technically it shouldn't be interfering with my, uh, with my communication system. But then you take it a step further and you look at the signal in something like a real-time spectrum analyzer. So as you look deeper at the signal, something with a little bit more um, a better chance of capturing all the behaviors of that signal. You see that not just within that, it's not just that one second pulse, but there's something happening that's extending into your frequency bands. So you can take that data, you can capture the 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 samples on a fine level, basically getting your IQ uh, data and moving it in, into a an analyzer where um, once you've captured that IQ data, you put it into a tool that helps you analyze it. In this case, this is a, a Spectro X software tool that's uh, that's managed by Bird Technologies. You take that data, you plug it in. It still looks the same. You still see your repeating one-second pulse, but you kind of see some things happening at the beginning and end of each pulse. As you zoom in and you start looking at it on a microsecond level, the very initial um, beginning of that transmission suddenly stretches way out into the band where you're trying to transmit. Same thing happens at the end of the signal. 
so these things, if I go back to my spectrum, um, these things are very difficult to catch because they're happening in such very, very minute um, portions of time, but they are extending out into the spectrum and they could interfere with your communication. So it takes a real, real fine detail, real signal analysis to try to understand that. So that's a hypothetical example of why signal analysis could be useful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the last step uh, in that we're going to discuss here is location finding. So you've done your spectrum monitoring, you've done your clearing, uh, you've done some signal identification, um, you feel like you have some clues, but now you want to go and identify the location of that interference so that you can eliminate it. Um, obviously, you know, why would you do that? This is the final step. Um, so in this case, you really have to go do some investigation work because the sources are usually either hidden by somebody transmitting it nefariously or unknown by the per unknown to be transmitted um, by the person who's actually causing the interference. So, uh, like I said, this is typically done once your interference has been confirmed and you have some some idea of the the power and frequency, so you can narrow in and start to look for the uh, the power levels and how they change and the best tool for this is directional power finding through a, um, through something that can look at the amplitude of the signal as it moves uh, through through different uh, different locations. So there are different tools for this. Um, there are walk and drive tests, as you uh, will discuss in a minute. You can walk through different areas, uh, zero in on where the power is. Uh, you can look. You have directional scanners that can, through audio tone, triangulate the signal. Uh, if you put out multiple different receivers, you can triangulate signals uh, and then often done through audio tones as well. So going back to um, just to remind you of our earlier example where we had this um, this dip in, perform in network performance, um, you know, power finding is how you go and find a source of this type of interference. And I'm still going to make you wait just a little bit longer to figure out, to learn more about that one. Uh, if I go back to this LTE jammer that I mentioned earlier, um, this is uh, this is the this was found by essentially using a directional antenna with the spectrum analyzer, um, waving it through the air until you found the strongest power source. And uh, in in this case, if even if the person who has installed this jammer denies its uh, its existence, you have pretty strong proof or, uh, or pretty strong evidence to say that we need to do further investigation in your area. <clears throat> so uh, basically those are the tools, or those are the, uh, the the methods that you use. So I'm gonna spend the last little bit of the webinar here discussing a tool that we have to offer that can be used in interference mitigation. That's our Fieldmaster Pro ms 20 A. This is our premium handheld spectrum analyzer. Um, we have uh, full frequency coverage options from 9 kilohertz up to 54 gigahertz uh, with no gaps in coverage. So uh, essentially you can you have options of models anywhere from uh, uh, 6 gigahertz maximum frequency up, I'm sorry, 9 gigahertz maximum uh, frequency coverage up to 54 gigahertz maximum coverage. Um, why is it important to have no gaps? Um, well, I'll discuss that a little bit more, but essentially interference can come from anywhere and uh, you don't want to be stuck not having a tool that can help you dig out or suss out where that signal is coming from. Um, fast sweep speeds with a low uh, noise floor, very important for finding signals that are down low in the noise um, and across wide frequency ranges. <clears throat> we offer 110 megahertz of real-time spectrum analysis. That's the widest RTSA bandwidth of any handheld spectrum analyzer. And what that gives you is this uh, 2.06 microsecond POI or a five nanosecond minimum detectable signal. Um, and what that means, POI stands for probability of intercept. And what it really means is that um, for any signal, for any pulsed signal that has a duration of uh, 2.06 microseconds or greater, the instrument will be able to capture that signal at full amplitude accuracy uh, with 100% probability. Um, but even better than that, the five, with the five nanosecond minimum detectable, even signals that are lower than 2.06 micro, microseconds, um, the the analyzer will still be able to pick those up. There just is a there may be a slight um, 
decrease in amplitude accuracy, which technically shouldn't matter much in, in, uh, when we're talking about just trying to location, doing location finding of interference. Um, it offers, the 2090A offers a 40 megahertz RBW and zero span. Again, very useful in pulse detection. Uh, if you have very narrow pulses, the wider RBW allows you uh, a better resolution um, in understanding your pulse behaviors. Uh, the, uh, we also just announced and released our IQ capture and streaming options. So the, in the field, you can capture up to 110 megahertz of IQ data at 32-bit resolution. Um, and that's fully customizable. You can go wider or narrower. We offer two gigabytes of, uh, two full gigabytes of RAM uh, uh, to be able to store those captures, which gives you uh, the ability to capture seconds to hours worth of data. And then if you need to do more, you can even do streaming into a USB device. <clears throat> the 2090, or the Fieldmaster Pro is also compatible with remote spectrum monitor, uh, mobile interference hunter tool, and mobile interference hunter tools which we'll discuss a little more in a second. And of course, it's ruggedized for outdoor use. So it's uh, the, the screen itself is IK08 protected glass. Uh, the box is drop tested from 26 different angles. Uh, it, uh, it's very rugged and very ready for your use in the field. <clears throat> so to discuss specifically the tools in each of the three categories I mentioned earlier, um, spectrum clearing and monitoring. So the Fieldmaster Pro offers a basic spectrum analyzer. There's options for real-time spectrum analysis, and then I mentioned mobile interference hunter. So to dig into each of those, with the basic spectrum analyzer, I mentioned uh, fast sweep speed and low noise floor. So why is that important? Well, in order to get um, your your trace down lower into the noise, you need to decrease your RBW. Uh, you need to have a good preamp with a good DANL. Uh, the 2090A offers all those things, so you're able to now sweep through wide, broad ranges of frequency. So if you're not sure, or if you have a wide range of frequency, let's say you're a regulator and your job is to go out and do some spectrum clearing, um, you can, with confidence, uh, without worrying about missing signals, you can drop that RBW, lower your noise floor, turn on your preamp and get a good good idea of what the signal looks like. You can set a limit line, and then anything that crosses that limit line, you save that trace data and you have it for processing later. <clears throat> um, with the real-time spectrum analysis, why is that important? Uh, for one thing, uh, this allows you to see signals on signals. So if you look at my example on the right, excuse me, we have um, just a basic LTE spectrum. And on the top picture, uh, you, it looks like it's normal spectrum. If you were having problems with the network, you might not be able to understand what's happening and why there are, are performance issues. But if you look at it with the RTSA, uh, this, with the density display and a real-time spectrum analyzer, you can see now under the signal, you have an underlying CW uh, interferer that might be, take, might be decreasing your network performance so you otherwise wouldn't have known is there. Um, <clears throat> You, I mentioned you can track sporadic or fast-moving signals, so if you do have a pulse signal that's very narrow, it might be missed by a typical spectrum analyzer. Um, with a with a real-time spectrum analyzer, you're going to be able to capture all of that movement, um, and then you can capture all of that movement over time with our spectrogram. <clears throat> Uh, with Mobile Interference Hunter, uh, there are several tools specifically for, obviously, interference hunting. Um, so we have, there's a spectrum clearing drive test solution. So if you look at the uh, this picture on the right here, as somebody drives through, uh, they, essentially you just set, a, set a, a limit line, that's the yellow line at the top, uh, and then drive through a section and anywhere where RF power in the frequency of interest crosses that threshold, you can identify those portions and then you can go back for each of those places where the signal crossed uh, your limit line and you can look at the spectrum and start to get some idea of what it is that's, uh, that's causing those RF violations and then do further investigation with uh, things like your uh, signal analysis or your power hunting tools. <clears throat> Uh, going back to signal identification, the Fieldmaster Pro, as I mentioned, offers real-time spectrum analysis, but um, even even cooler, something new uh, for the product is this IQ capture and streaming. So I'm going to fo focus on that one here. Um, essentially what this allows you to do is the, the analyzer is capturing hundreds of thousands of FFTs per second, which is 
way, way, way more data than can be displayed on a, a, a screen that's refreshing at 60 hertz or even 120 hertz. Um, so what we're, what, with IQ Capture and IQ Streaming, what you're doing is, is you're capturing all of those samples and into their really most basic um, and most most high resolution time uh, time uh, time resolutions, and uh, and we're able to then play them back. So uh, basically, here you do a capture. Um, that's why in the earlier example, when with our radar, when you don't see what's happening at the beginning and end of those chirps because it's happening so fast, it's really um, the the resolution of the screen can't even capture that movement. But and so it has to be summarized into the density data. Uh, what you can do now with IQ Capture and Streaming is you can take that data, capture it, play it back, and see all the different pieces. <clears throat> um, so the with the lower noise and greater resolution, that's with the 32-bit data resolution, you can get lower noise floor in lower bandwidth signals. With two gigabyte, gigabytes of dedicated memory, that gives you, with 110 megahertz worth of bandwidth, <clears throat> if you're going to capture that wide, it does take a lot of data. Uh, so that supports wider captures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then uh, triggering is really important here as well. So if you're in the field and you're doing, let's say you're still doing a little bit of um, investigation in spectrum and you're not quite sure what's happening with the, <clears throat> the interference, you can set it out, um, monitor a certain area, set a limit line, and trigger your IQ capture as, uh, as you have RF energy that crosses over that, that uh, video threshold. Uh, so essentially now you can go back, even with a pre-trigger, <clears throat> you can set a negative trigger, we fill a buffer. Um, you can go back in uh, in time slightly to the event that triggered the capture. You can see all of the information of everything that happened that uh, that was unknown signals within your spectrum. And then we do offer as well, uh, this, the Fieldmaster Pro is the only handheld spectrum analyzer that offers uh, streaming of IQ data. So if in your case you want to be doing um, longer captures or wider captures and you need more data you can use uh, for example an SSD connected to our USB port and stream data into directly to a USB drive you can stream PC over Ethernet that's just limited by the transfer rate of your network um, or you can even we even support streaming to the <clears throat> IQC 5000p from bird technologies uh, for location finding um, I've already talked about RTSA and, and we also offer something called our interference finder. Uh, there's a PIM Hunter probe that I'll show you, remote spectrum monitor and our mobile interference hunter. So we've talked about RTSA. The interference finder is essentially an audio tone um, that as you are, uh, as you've decided you know kind of where the signal is, let's take that LTE jammer, for example, you can now point your uh, directional antenna like a Yagi and as you sweep through uh, a geography, let's say you're standing in front of the strip mall, as you point it at different stores, that audio tone, there, there's an output audio tone. And as you point towards where that jammer is located, that audio tone will increase in pitch and give you clues on where you can go to find it. Um, <clears throat> so now I'll stop keeping you in suspense on this random source. Um, Going back to again where this network operator saw some dips in their KPI, couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, so our engineers, our field engineers went out with this carrier, did some research, and essentially by utilizing the RTSA, they were able to find that um, a private home had gone to eBay and purchased a, a repeater. Uh, but this repeater was uh, very poorly manufactured. So instead of only um, instead of only amplifying and repeating the signal the downlink signal from one carrier it was bleeding into the uplink signal of another carrier to where it was completely distorting the uplink and ruining all of the all of the uplink data or all the uplink bandwidth of that carrier so with the with the fieldmaster pro they went out and this is the picture this is an actual picture of the signal utilizing the rtsa where normally on a spectrum analyzer, you would only see, uh, you really would only see very sporadic movement in the uplink. But because this uplink was being amplified so heavily with the RTSA, they were able to go look at that spectrum and pinpoint the exact location of where that, that uplink was being magnified. 
<clears throat> um, the Fieldmaster Pro works with our PIM Hunter as well. So if uh, you connect, basically you connect your PIM Hunter, it produces your two tones to create your third order, um, your uh, intermodulation product. Uh, you then utilize uh, the PIM probe, excuse me, the PIM probe connected to the analyzer. And as you go around, let's say you're on a rooftop, you're looking for sources of interference. You essentially touch, like touching the wand to any sort of source of interference. Um, in this case, I mentioned earlier, rusty bolts is a, a very common uh, source. You could have uh, rusty nails that are underneath shingles that are completely invisible, but could be um, completely interfering with your, your network. Uh, we've seen examples where old cables that had been um, cut and removed, cut and were not being used, but had not been removed and were just hanging from a tower were causing intermodulation. <clears throat> Um, the Fieldmaster Pro is also compatible with the uh, remote spectrum monitor tools. So I mentioned triangulation earlier. So if you were to set multiple instruments out, analyzing a different area by use, utilizing the uh, TDOA, um, the TDOA algorithms, essentially you can create, you can get an idea of from the three different analyzers together where that signal is coming from. And then you can utilize something like a mobile interference hunter solution where essentially you drive an area. As you drive through an area, you can start to see, if you notice on the right hand, the lower right hand picture, you start to, these red X's represent where you start to see interference and you can then um, go on foot with something like the interference hunter and try to track those down. So uh, the message here is that the Fieldmaster Pro is an ideal tool for interference mitigation. Uh, it can be utilized in all three stages, spectrum monitoring, signal intelligence, and signal location. Um, those are all the slides I have. Uh, I think we can go ahead and open it up for questions. All right. Thank you very much, Russ. That was great information on the always important topic of interference. Um, we'll begin to ask some questions now from our attendees. Remember, you can type in a question to me at any time. Um, the first question we have is if, if maybe you could just go over, Russ, what situations you would use a regular spectrum analyzer versus an RTSA? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, the, the RTSA is, is obviously a, a powerful tool. Um, for those of you, for anybody not familiar with how an RTSA varies or differs in architecture from a regular spectrum analyzer, we do have a lot of information on if you go to nritsu.com and look at the ms 2098 there's white papers in the library section there on on um, rtsa but essentially what's happening is is your um where a, a typical spectrum analyzer it does a, it it captures data and then it stops capturing while it processes data so there's a gap in the middle there where you're sort of doing a capture process capture process and if you have an interference that um, appears during your process period you may miss it when you're not capturing and you could uh, it could uh, hinder your ability to hunt down interference. Um, so RTSA is, is very valuable, especially when you have um, very intermittent signals, when you have narrow pulse signals, uh, and when you have signal on signal, it can be very valuable. Um, but RTSA, is once you go wider than this, the instrument bandwidth, um, you're really essentially no longer RTSA, you're now stitching together. Um, and you have, you're back to the same problem with the spectrum analyzer. So a spectrum analyzer is a really good tool um, for wider bandwidths. When you have something, you know, wider than your 100 megahertz, you know, for instance, the, with the Fieldmaster Pro with 110 megahertz uh, analysis bandwidth, let's say you want to measure a full gigahertz worth of spectrum. This is where a spectrum analyzer can be really valuable. You can lower your RBW, turn on your preamp, drop your noise floor, set limit lines, look for interference. Okay, good. Um, and then, can you talk a bit about 5G and whether um, passive intermodulation is an issue in milli millimeter wave, you know, 5G spectrum? Yeah, that's actually, that's a good question. I, I think that um, I, the answer to that actually at this point is sort of unknown, um, but there, I think the, the industry started with an assumption that once we get into millimeter wave, that PIM is suddenly not an issue ever again. Um, but I believe we, I believe we're starting to see that that might not be the case. So really, the the advice on that one is is that as you're deploying your 5G millimeter wave, you want to obviously make sure that you're installing in a clean environment, and it's worthwhile to take some time to do some evaluation on that. Okay, good. 
Um, another question about how wide of a span you should use with the Yagi. Um, normal Yagis are 45 degrees. Do you have or recommend something with a similar span? Uh, I, I guess if I understand the question, the, I'd have to understand what the the um, the attendee means by span. If we're talking about the directionality of the antenna itself, you certainly, the more directional you can get, the better when you're talking about interference finding with the Yagi antenna. Um, we've seen where we've used, uh, for, exa for example, if we have log mag antennas, which are supposedly directional, but they have a much wider um, uh, acceptance range of, of signal. You're, so you when you're trying to point your signal you you know you can be looking backwards and forwards and you can be running around in circles because you never really know where that signal is coming from so the more directionality you have the better now as far as if we're talking about frequency span of the instrument itself then the the more narrow i mean it really just depends on how well you know your signal obviously the more the more you can narrow down your span the faster your sweep speed will be the better your response will be as you wave that anti that yagi antenna around okay all right, good. And then there's a question about whether you can embed a signal identifier into a signal. And um, the attendee gives the example of New York City requires high rises to install a dedicated fire department frequency um, into them. And then so he's he's looking for a rapid way to identify the systems uh, to, when they come on to prevent interference. So a way to kind of identify a specific signal, I think. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, with the public safety, we do have a lot of, um, of material on public safety uh, frequencies. I, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on public safety. So uh, to the person who asked this question, uh, please reach out. We have a lot we can share. From my knowledge of this, um, certainly interference, clearing out those those frequency ranges of interference is absolutely critical and, and of the utmost importance to ensuring public safety so that groups like fire departments can respond quickly. Um, if you want to know, I mean, the signal itself, um, those are those are basic signals that can be detected and can be analyzed by analyzers, um, and uh, and so it, it is. There are tools that can help you verify whether or not the signal you're seeing in those bandwidths are the the intended ones for like a fire department or not intended. Okay, good. Um, another question on the RTSA: Can it be used? Um, before, after the drive tests, and um, how about in building? So uh, yes, it, it, RTSA, like I said, the, the the powerful use of the tool is that you um, you see intermittent signals. Uh, you can take those power levels. You can use them in any uh, in any type of situation. Um, it is not limited to indoor or outdoor. The the RTSA itself, the sweep is not. Typically, the only the only thing that you get hindered in when going indoor, making measurements indoor, is when you're looking at trying to make GPS synchronized measurements. Um, so, for instance, if you're trying to do like an indoor coverage mapping of a building, uh, we do have tools that support indoor coverage mapping, utilizing accelerometers and um, other tools that can help you locate rather than GPS. Um, but for interference hunting, you, there's no limitation to going indoors. Okay, and uh, kind of along those same lines, uh, on locating interfe locating interference, is there any latitude or longitude to pinpoint the exact location? Uh, so that goes back to some of those software tools I mentioned before, like the remote spectrum monitor and the mobile interference tools. So those are specific mapping tools. So essentially, once you um, once you start to identify um, places on the map and then on the analyzer itself like the the Fieldmaster Pro uh, there is a GPS antenna you connect that uh, GPS antenna to the box uh, and then in uh, you can actually put the GPS data right on the screen as you walk through and look at, for information so if you were trying to do a report on interference that GPS information is right there on the screen okay um, another ten attendee is asking about whether there's a virtual interface with remote control so that the system can be remotely operated through a LAN or a WAN mm -hmm. yeah so with the Fieldmaster Pro uh, in particular uh, we do offer a PC client which is essentially a mirroring of the uh, actually 
let me take a step back. This the the architecture of the instrument is a front end back end software. So everything you see on the screen itself is front end software that's running um, protocol commands to a back end. We offer a PC tool that has direct access to that back end and then can control the data itself over a, a wireless network or a, a connected network. So essentially, from any as long as you can get the instrument on the same network, you can control the instrument from anywhere. Okay. Um... In your experience, what are some of the most common sources of interference with cellular networks? What do you see the most of? Um, well, I, I mentioned before, there's uh, a lot of it is a lot of it is uh, unintentional kinds of things where you have just old or, or uncontrolled equipment, things that were purchased through unauthorized sources or um, just not not made through um, qualified manufacturing uh, processes uh, so you get a lot of yeah a lot of like the the example that I used of the repeater where um, somebody just thought well I you know I have a low signal so I'm just gonna buy you know when I googled hey I have bad signal and some something popped up and said we'll buy this repeater um, they went and bought one without knowing really that 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 product itself uh, doesn't do everything that it, you know it, it it has unintended consequences so that that's a lot of it um, I mentioned the the cable TV so uh, as you see erosion in existing communication systems coming up making measurements um, certainly it's the the non nefarious is the more common type stuff and then of course you have the the, the nefarious type of you know we we've heard examples of um, not for to telecommunications but we heard an example once in one country where a person drove a car up next to an airport and turned on a jammer to jam all of the control tower signals, uh, all communications from the control tower, which obviously is an extremely serious offense. And they had to use a tool like the Fieldmaster Pro to go out and to identify where that jammer was coming from and stop it. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, another attendee is asking um, to explain a bit more about well, what the preamp does and then give an example of how to use that. Okay, so so built into the instrument, um, you have so coming into the RF port, uh, you have a, a certain signal level, uh, and we we don't we, you know we have we have to avoid damaging any of the electronics within the instrument. So if you overload the the front end of that instrument, you could damage the product itself. But in cases like interference hunting, where typically you're looking at lower level signals, we have a built-in amplifier that provides about 20 dB of amplification to your signal. It drops your noise floor pulls your signal out of the noise and by being built in um, we're able to essentially account for that amplification and um, calibrate for any changes in amplification to the signal so we're still able to provide a, a high accuracy on amplitude level of your signal while dropping that noise floor so the way it typically works is um, as long as your reference level is down in down lower in the minus 20 minus 40 range you can turn that preamp on to get that extra gain and it's just software controlled. Okay, good. Um, you had mentioned fluorescent light interference, um, but there, uh, there's also the impression that LED lamps are an increasing source of interference. Does that fit with your experiences? Uh, that, you know, I, anecdotally, I, I had not heard. I, the LEDs are a problem, but I mean, we're, we're talking about emissions of, of signals. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there are manufacturers out there that are building things that could interfere. I, I just know that in my only experience, anecdotally, I've only ever heard of fluorescent lights. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions about um, your vision mon monitor and vision locate um, offerings and um, whether you compare this this product with the vision monitor and locate applications? Um, well, so the the way I, I guess if I understand the question correctly, I, I think essentially the key thing here is is that the the software tools themselves these are these are tools that are used for um, trying to identify the location of interference or or monitor spectrum. Um, th these are so those are software tools, and then the hardware itself can come from different places. The hardware processing can come from different places. So, typically in the past, our vision software has been used with our remote spectrum monitor um, analyzers, um, but we do have compatibility with our 2090A. So, um, for basic um, 
for basic remote spectrum monitoring, um, you can use a 2090A. The, the, the difference is that um, you know with a with a Fieldmaster Pro you can get higher in frequency. We do offer up to 54 gigahertz. You're limited in your with the typical uh, remote spectrum monitor tools, um, but those are um, generally they they have offerings that are um, uh, made for more long-term installation. So they're you know I, they're IP rated and things like that. All right, great. Um, another attendee is asking if you can um, explain how to get SNR out of the measurement and what tool is best to use for that. Uh, so, for measuring signal to noise, um, with, I, so for for um, everybody on the call, SNR is typically your signal to noise ratio. Um, in order to measure signal, you can. I mean, obviously, you can do basic. Uh, you can do that manually through marker measurements. You can measure your amplitude and get an average noise level. Um, you can you can even set noise figure or uh, noise markers to measure your your actual real noise uh, level of your signal. Um, there are automated tools in certain cases to make those measurements. Um, in the case of the Fieldmaster Pro, we do offer um, we do offer readings of signal and noise ratios in our demod options. So if you're demodulating a 5G or an LT signal, we do offer those those in there. Um, for basic measurements, it's more of a post-processing thing on our side. Okay. Um, another question about the MS2090A. Uh, um, does it cover PIM for 700 megahertz to 2.1 uh, IM frequencies? Yeah, well, so the key the key for on the analyzer side is that yeah we do we do make sweeps on those uh, at those frequencies. So the way the analyzer works is you you connect the probe, you um, you set your frequency range, you set a, a limit line, and and you're you're basically as you um, as you tap on the uh, the different pieces where you suspect PIM to come from, um, you're going to get you can get that audio tone changing up and down. Um, the the PIM master itself, um, I believe, is I believe supports 700 megahertz. I, to be honest, that I haven't been as up to date on where that particular project is. Okay, and then we have just um, a comment from an attendee, which is this is a good point. I have a feeling this attendee's on this committee, but he said that regarding the question um, on signal identifiers, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee has a subcommittee devoted to requiring embedded Im, embedded identifiers in some devices, just um, as some information for our attendees. Um, and also, I just wanted to let attendees know that all of your questions are being captured um, so we can follow up. Even if we don't ask them right now, we'll, we can, uh, and Ritsu can follow up with you to answer your questions. So. Um, we'll take um, a few more here. Um, can an alarm be set to alert real time when a specific signal is detected? Uh, yeah, well, so basically, the way that would work in this product is you set a limit line. Um, very very easy. We have complex limit lines that can be set. So let's say you have uh, you're monitoring a portion of signal where there is a known signal. You can create a limit line around that signal, and then um, you can uh, an alarm will sound if you cross the limit. You can turn the alarm on. You can also, like I mentioned before, set a, a save on event. So if uh, if that limit line is crossed, you could then save that trace. Uh, so you can monitor it later and see okay where did I you know where did that come from where was the frequency and so but as I mentioned before now let's say you know exactly where the frequency of that violation happened uh, you can then go do deeper analysis okay and then this is a curiosity question the repeater that you mentioned during your presentation that was interfering um, was it interfering at 39 gigahertz the attendee would like to know uh, no, in this case, this was a LTE. Uh, this was okay. it was meant to. It was a repeater for an LTE downlink uh, of one carrier, and it was um, it was unintentionally amplifying the uplink in a different frequency band of a LTE of a different carrier of another LTE network. Okay, good. Um, Another attendee is asking about the compatibility with the MA two thousand seven hundred A and if there's a mapping option. 
Uh, so we are working on a mapping option. Um, today we do offer several tools like the um, we are compatible with our uh, neon coverage mapping tools for indoor and outdoor coverage mapping. We do work with Mobile Interference Hunter um, specifically on the MA2700 that or that intent itself for, for those not aware is uh, it's used to do directional finding. It's a essentially you um, as, as you're looking for signals, you can wave it through an area. As you get power, you can drop a line on a map to try to triangulate a signal. So um, all that stuff is under development for the Fieldmaster Pro, but it can be used today with any of our other handheld uh, spectrum analyzers like our MS, like our uh, Spectrum Master, for example. Okay. Um, does, does the set allow use of, for example, a bird switch with an algorithm to pinpoint direction of an inconsistent interference source through multi-directional sampling? Uh, wow, that's a great question. I, to be completely honest, it's I'm specific. not. Yeah, I am. I am not. I'm not familiar with what a bird switch is. So, um, yeah, maybe I'm okay. exposing we myself get, there. If, no, please, please can. capture that question. And we'll get you in touch with the right experts. Yep, absolutely. All right, good. All right, well, we've run through our questions and we're nearing our time here. So, if we didn't get to your question again, or if um, you know, if you if we you capture it, we'll get work to get you answers and follow up as soon as we can. And again, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to all registrants and will be available at mccmag.com. Thank you again to Russ and to all the attendees and to Enritsu for serving as the sponsor of today's webinar. That concludes our presentation. Have a great rest of your day.